Good evening, everyone. It is 531. I'll call our Committee of the Whole meeting to order on Monday, May the 2nd. The agenda is there for your review. You can have a motion and get things underway. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hibbs. Yeah, I'll move that we accept the agenda as presented. Appreciate it. Councillor Hoekstra. Thanks, Mayor Creasy. I just had a question about the agenda because CEO Gowdy said we would be talking about mayor for the day, but that's not on the agenda. So is that correct? That was mentioned last meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I just was curious. If you would like an opportunity to do so, we can certainly add it on or prefer to do that another time. Um, so no, we we had when Councillor Hibbs asked us what uh, the items for the agenda were. I went to one of our uh, agenda management systems, and at that time we had forecast that that would be uh, there, but we're actually doing some additional research, so it's it's just not okay. ready for this evening. Not a problem. We will postpone that for a later date. Good memory, though, Councillor Hookster, because I had forgot about that one myself. Councillor Oxen. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. I, I know Councillor Dallas, you, you had indicated you wanted to have some general dis discussion. Is that possible to have it on the agenda? Or do we need to put that on there? I think it would have to be a specific item. Is it relating to? Well, that was the point of it. It wasn't a specific item, though. That okay. was his point of that he brought up. So maybe I don't know if you want to speak to that. So just to be sure, was that for the written page that we were given or for something additional? Go ahead, okay. Councilor Dallas. Thank you, Mayor Casey. Uh, this was just a general ask uh, for just broad topics in general, not related to anything, just kind of free flowing conversation, but we'd kind of discussed how that would be able to happen in the future. So as of right now, I don't have anything prepared for that. So I'll pass on that for right now. Okay, thank you. You did make the motion, did you not? Yeah. Very good. Anyone else? All those in favor of the agenda? Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks everyone. Unanimous. Director Pichet, first up is the bylaw 468 review, the community standards bylaw. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Before council this evening is the results of the public engagement feedback regarding the community standards bylaw. Social media channels, the 2022 spring, show, uh, spring trade show where Coffee with Council was held and a dedicated email address were offered to the public to provide feedback. Some of the suggestions to generate the conversations with the public were limiting the overhang of the trees and alleys to at least four meters or 13 feet and over sidewalks to 2.4 meters or eight feet. Review of the weeds classification to be enforced to determine if bylaw should bylaw enforcement should include prohibited noxious weeds and noxious weeds. The reduction of the length of grass and weeds from the current eight inches or 20 centimeters. Residents' responsibilities for controlling vegetation on growth on and in sidewalks. Eliminating the 150 meter buffer requirements for noise limits on commercial snow clearing and enforcing standards through either fines or contractors on buildings showing significant physical deterioration or decay. For example, paint chipping, broken or missing windows, siding, shingles, shutters, eaves, roofing or finished material. In regards to the feedback, of the 10 Facebook posts that were uh, placed on Facebook, there were zero comments. And at the trade show, there were some comments pertaining to specific properties rather than the bylaw itself, which bylaw enforcement services will be reviewing on a case-by-case -case basis. But the comments that were received regarding the community standards bylaw were that one resident requested that they be able to turn their front yard into a garden and they would like to also see the city allow agriscaping on the properties. The other uh, comment from the, from the trade show was that more of a questions around the trees and shrubs and that if the height is 
just for the overhang or if it's for the total tree. And that's where we'll be having to put some, some more clarification within there if we move forward with that. Um, there were two letters that were received about the noise section in the bylaw. The first one was from an individual who had um, wishes to have more enforcement for noise violations. And the second letter was from a business who has been impacted by the current bylaw and how it limits their ability to complete contracted work. To be perfectly honest, there wasn't a lot of feedback. Therefore, administration's recommendation is to extend the consultation pro process throughout into the summer because as the growing season progresses there will be more issues that arise and that will allow for better engagement with the public. If there are any questions I'm happy to take them now. Thank you. Thanks Director Pichet. So just to be clear then, so the, the city uh, put out 10 posts and there was not a single comment. No, I double checked with our communications coordinator and not one comment on any of those posts. Well, isn't that interesting? Thank you. Yes. Councillor Ross. Thank you, Marquise. Uh, I support, I guess, the extending of the uh, opportunity for citizens to reply, but it's like you say, I think it's very interesting that there wasn't any replies. I do strongly support, I have, I'm very positive with the direction of our added to our bylaw enforcement uh members uh for direction <clears throat> i think that is going to be huge uh i think once again over the summer uh because i will say i still strongly feel that more conversations could be had uh because uh i take it quite personally obviously so i i feel very strong with that direction of another member being uh, having some history and they, they are, our members can be mentored with more direction. So I think that through the summer, I think it will be nice to hear a report from Matt after that is done. Councillor Hibbs. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Yeah, I'm, I'm appreciative that administration is saying that we should spend a little bit more time gathering more info on that. I think um, farmers markets, for example, would be a good reason, I mean, a good um, opportunity. Um, another thing with the Facebook post, I, I totally appreciate that that was being put out lots and, and I think that was um, a valiant effort. However, I think going forward, if I might make the suggestion that they be targeted so that you specifically address like, what are your thoughts on, I don't know, like grass, like height or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, so it's specific because I think that one, people just don't know the bylaws and two, it's just so overwhelming. They don't know, does this apply here? Is it, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, I think if it's really targeted, it will elicit more um, feedback. But I did have a question actually on sort of our process that we do when we do address a, a, you know, a problem property. And we talked about this, you know, flagging system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, that isn't part of the bylaw. Is that, is that correct? It's not part of the bylaw. Is it part of a city policy or is it just something informal that we've decided that that's how we're going to do it, but it's not actually written down as far as, um, you know, officially? It is officially written down as an administrative directive. As a directive. Okay, sorry, that's what I meant kind of by policy, but okay. Um, and then I guess my question, and I don't necessarily want to, hash through that right now but just following a conversation that i had with a resident earlier today it really made me think that i think that it would be beneficial for you know this group of of people to be sort of made aware and step through that process and how it is going to um go going forward especially with the makeup that we have in the bylaw um enforcement office now um so uh just sort of giving you a heads up that i will be asking about that in the future so i just figured i we're talking about it tonight that i would um do that now because i think that that lends itself to creating um, a bit more um, confidence, I guess, by community members that things are, you know, that there is a process in place that is being followed through and this is exactly how it's meant to work and that we're all on the same page that way as well. So I would appreciate that. Thank you. Councillor Hoogstra. Thanks, Mayor Creasy. <clears throat> I guess I don't really have a comment to be made should we extend the consultation process. I, I or I don't know, people did have an opportunity to respond, so I'm kind of okay with where it's sitting. I just have a comment around CCANs. Where do we address CCANs in our, is that part of community standards or is that, where does that go? It's actually within the land use bylaw. 
under planning and development. Okay. Isn't there a little bit overlap ish? <laughs> I don't know. Just throwing that out there. So, Chief Cody? Yes, there is overlap between development standards and community standards. I would say they're interlinked very tightly. Um, but when your um, CCANs have typically been uh, approached as a contraven contravening land use rather than an eyesore um, or something that um, directly impedes a nearby property's ability to enjoy the property. Um, so we enforce on that through the land use bylaw, uh, which is through the planning and development authorities. Um, and you have a specific subdivision and development authorities bylaw that grants those authorities to the CAO. Um, and then down through our planning and developments uh, offices, mm -hmm. although they often um, work closely with the bylaw enforcement officers to serve certain notifications. And then because the two are interlinked, Often when you have issues of contraventions on land use bylaw, there are also corresponding community standards violations on that problem. Councilor Ross. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. There's obviously processes within the MGA that obviously bylaw has to follow and adhere to. But when you have repetition properties that are, I'm sure in your time already, as it's, you don't even, can through the repetition, can that still not be recognized rather than starting the whole process over? Like, there's just some way that we could appeal through the MGA as to change them processes to make them more streamlined, even within municipal bylaw. Like, is there some ways to go right to M within the MGA that would make it more efficient for enforcement? You've got it. So I think that the approach to repeat offenders is contained within our bylaw and within the administrative directive and it involves escalating fines. And certainly they are targeted for uh, like frequent violators are targeted on um, routine inspections. So with the system that Councillor Hibbs was referring to in the uh, process, those repeat offender properties are flagged um, and they are receive a higher level of monitoring for compliance than other properties. They also have no, no warnings. Uh, it's automatic to, to fines. That is something that we're hoping to prove our implementation of that policy to make sure that those repeat offenders are being deterred through escalating fines. Uh, but that's certainly in our direction to staff, and we've reinforced that recently. Um, and this is through our written administrative directive. <clears throat> Councilor Ross, are you suggesting with some of these problem properties that following the process uh, to try and make them compliant within the MGA has been a little, a little onerous upon the municipality? Is that exactly? I just think the repetition. It's almost like the process is being taken advantage of by the property owner itself. They know that it's repetitiously starts over and it's just it's time, it's hours, and I just think it's it's inefficient, it's frustrating, and it's the same ones or and that's where do you start from the top and go to the whatever the process of within MGA to you know to get that attention so that as a municipality there can be more direct enforcement rather than the painstaking process that is, in my opinion, quite often taken advantage of. So, and that's for everybody's benefit, you know, and and th there can be improvements on both sides. For example, I kind of took it personally downtown. The grass seriously was a foot, foot high. You cannot tell me that somebody within city staff, Bala, could not see this property. And yeah, I just kind of put it bluntly to him you're in the downtown high traffic area are you not embarrassed of your property and they changed uh, uh service providers right from corporate and it was done but i mean it's more conversations need to be had in that direction it doesn't you know kind of skip out 
Victor Ware is a little more direct. It's blatantly obvious, I guess, and that's I'm passionate about it. But it just I feel what the process is taken advantage of, and that's it's inefficient. It's frustrating, and it's repetitious, and it's. I think it would be tough to argue that that is not the case in a few instances. Thankfully, we do not really have that many in Lacombe, which is a good thing. Um, certainly, we have as much input um, opportunity as anybody else in the province for changing the MGA, but I would suggest that it had better be pretty specific, the changes that we're after. Uh, if because it's that's a lengthy process and not something that's going to be taken lightly because it does apply across the entire province. But uh, I, that's certainly a path that's open to us. I think within our own community, we've got some changes that we can probably implement substantially quicker than that process would be to hopefully come up with a resolution to some of these areas that have been problems over over the past few years. Councillor Connick. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. So what I gather, it sounds like we're going to put it back out there, get more feedback. Do we have a timeline? Are we looking end of summer to bring this back? What's this? What's the, what are we feeling here? Probably late summer, early fall. Um, that would probably allow many uh, farmers markets interactions and uh, that'd be a good opportunity for engagement at that point. So we've had a few councillors speak on the garnering more input and uh, Certainly, this council and administration has been uh, very willing to take input on these items. For myself, I'm just not sure how how much more input is going to be garnered, no matter how long we extend it. There's a lot of items in here that will never apply to the majority of our citizens, and it's only when problem areas where they do become an issue. So, as much as I admire the administration for suggesting that we do garner more input i i can't say as i'm a huge fan of it i really don't know that our uh, final decisions are going to be altered much if at all from it but i'm willing to go along with it if that's what council feels is the appropriate route councillor gullickson thank you mayor creasy i i agree with the mayor in this case i I, I enjoy the farmers markets and the input we do get from there, but I don't think we'll see too much on this, but we can certainly try. I would like to make sure we have the proper posters and information saying we're looking for that. So they specifically come to us on, on those topics. As far as the MGA goes, how much does the MGA have to say about our bylaw? Like I thought our bylaw was up to us to enforce and to administer. It really does come down to the orders when when it's being provided. Um, there has to be a reasonable amount of time and that can be determined within our bylaw. However, we do have to give at least one week for any order to be mailed out and we have to allow for seven days and then the reasonable amount of time has to happen after that. So to be clear with that, uh... Councillor Gullickson, I think that the talk before was to do with very problematic properties, not with just the uh, bylaw in general, but in, in very problem properties. Is that a fair assumption, Chief Gowdy? Yeah, I think um, the important thing to remember is the MGA does allow for you to add the cost of doing work um, related to community standards directly to the tax roll. They do not allow you to add fines or fees associated with that work directly to the property tax roll. And so if you're to ever collect on those, um, you end up having to actually rewrite them under the provincial statute as a provincial ticket. Uh, and that way the, the province will serve and, and actually follow up and prosecute on the municipality's behalf. And so while it's not a important to us whether we get the hundred dollars or two hundred fifty dollars or even a thousand dollar ticket you'll spend more money prosecuting mm -hmm. it really um as far as the deterrence factor which i think is uh what councillor ross was really talking about is escalating fines are about deterring future infractions 
And so if you're to try and enforce those, ultimately it falls to a provincial statute to do so. And so at that point, they apply quite a high standard of what's required um, for you to prove loss of property value or loss of enjoyment, peaceful enjoyment of uh, a nearby property. It's, it's a very high standard. And so that actually, that is a good tie back to Councillor Hoekstra's question about why we enforce on CCANs that way rather than through the community standards is because the province would not, would almost certainly not recognize that as a unsightliness issue that's affecting a property's value or enjoyment, just having a CCAN, that's, that's below the threshold of how impactful it would have to be. Um, whereas they've given quite broad authority to a municipality to enforce on land use issues within the municipality, where we're sort of the masters of our own house in that sense. Um, but when it comes to the municipality coming in and fining and enforcing based on unsightliness, if someone refuses to pay the municipal fines, you do have to go, the, go that provincial route. So the MGA itself actually fairly limited impact mm -hmm. um, on our ability to do so. It's it's outside of that. Really. Yeah, I I think the goal is not to collect the money; it's to clean up the property, right? To to get to that point. I mean, like as far as these the fines go, because the fine is to encourage them to clean up their mess that not because it just because if he, they refuse to pay and refuse to clean up the mess they're not getting either one at that point but i mean it's i just didn't think the mga had that much to do with it actually on the actual enforcement side chief Cody. um i would just uh, for me actually the fine the fine really I don't look at that as a causal link to getting the property cleaned up. I don't think finding someone for long grass makes them more likely to do it versus a warning to actually clean it up. For me, the fine, like we have good mechanisms for actually doing the work, completing the work. And again, the MGA actually gives quite broad powers for you to say, well, I did this work on your behalf. Here's the bills for it and I'm adding those to the tax roll and I just take it. So getting the work done actually and getting the property cleaned up, actually it's not the fines and the repeat fines don't really help us. Like a, a larger fine, a thousand dollar initial fine or a ten thousand dollar third offense fine doesn't actually help us get the property cleaned up, but I think it does prevent it from reoccurring. So if someone's received a five hundred dollar fine, they're going to be a lot, in my opinion, they're going to be a lot more careful about those same conditions not appearing on the property. And especially if we tell them, hey, this is your second fine. And also, just so you're aware, you're on our inspection route at this point. I think that does help someone. It prevents it from occurring again. Yes, and that, and that is. Councillor Dallas. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess the one thing I had was you guys have a piece of paper in front of you. I don't know, is now an appropriate time to just mention why I brought that uh, forward or is that? Okay. Um, so the one uh, for possible community standards was, uh, it was brought up during our meet and greet at the uh, trade show and it was uh, parking on front yards and property. And uh, so I've looked around and I saw in other communities they had similar bylaws in place to prevent actions like this. Unfortunately, digging through bylaws and parking, I was struggling to find it. So I just had to find a broad one. And it was placed as no parking shall be permitted in the front yard except on a properly constructed and surfaced driveway used to gain direct access to a garage or carport or rear or side yard parking space. Um, some of the wording that I said was, I guess it says permitted in here. So the other choice was approved parking pad. Um, my main thing was just not having vehicles, trailers, utility, just parked directly on grass in front yards. Or if uh, the case was it was a corner lot, uh, I would choose street facing um, property. 
And that was just something that came up in one of the solutions that uh, I thought we could look at adding as well. Thanks, Councillor Dallas. Myself, I think that that would be a good addition. I'm just curious if anything after driveway is necessary or could just end right there as far as I'm concerned. You can still say the same thing. But I, I would like to see something added to the bylaw that uh, reflects this message. Okay. Um, sorry, do you mind if I just add on to the driveway? Certainly. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, I'm not sure the city's operation on it, but whether it's driveway or some sort of landscape parking space, I'm not sure if that's an approval, but I think the, the biggest thing is, yeah, just making sure it's an approved, approved, uh, yeah, driveway parking space. So that's my biggest issue with it. Chief Cody. So Councillor Dallas did, <clears throat> excuse me, did me the favor of letting me know ahead of time that he was going to bring this up, uh, giving us time to do a little bit of pre uh, research about our existing bylaw in this regard. And so I would just, if you wouldn't mind, I'll uh, give a sort of a brief overview of where we're at just to inform your discussion going forward. Sure, before you do that, Councillor Connick, was there a question you had first? Well, I would just, I, I feel we're kind of going around in circles here. So I think we either have to decide that we want more public feedback or not, or, and if not, then that's, then we need to tackle this stuff tonight, get her done and then they can prepare a bylaw. That's my feeling. I, I don't know what everyone else thinks, but, and I can go either way, by the way. Thank you. Chief Cody. So the existing um, situation with the city's land use bylaw is that we do require <coughs> driveways to be a permit that that's a permitted land use. So someone would have to come and register their driveway, or it would have to appear on the original development permit for that property. That's the current land use bylaw. Um, so if you wanted to, if you had no front drive garage right now, you would come to City Hall and say, oh, I would like to add this driveway. We would look at the on-street configuration and the curbing and what you've proposed and everything and say, yeah, that's good. Or no, actually, that, that's not something we're going to uh, allow. It's $120 fee if you're doing it after the fact. If it's with the original development permit, of course, it's just part of the whole permit cost. You do have a requirement in your land use bylaw that says any wherever a driveway or access meets a paved hard surfaced roadway, it shall be paved or hard surfaced. Switch, uh, which, which makes actually a difficult spot, I, I think. It is my expectation, I have not gone back and actually confirmed this, but it's my expectation that under previous land use bylaws, driveways were allowed on a more informal basis. And so there are significant areas of the community, the older areas, some of the bronze area, um, Maple Bay, some of that, where there are extensive graveled driveways. And I would say a mix of what you would consider a properly approved, or sorry, properly constructed gravel driveway, and some that are really a mud thing that someone's added some spare gravel over the years to prevent the mud a little bit and, and would not meet uh, your intent. So the challenge becomes, if you make this rule, you have all these driveways in the uh, older areas, many of which I expect will not appear on a permit or an original permit or, or have not gotten a permit since, which are graveled and have been in a gravel state for probably you know, 20 years, some of them, which I think you would consider from from our discussion as acceptable if if that's how the community has grown up and there's many of these and and it's just a gravel is kind of a standard parking area and so i think you would actually need <clears throat> to look at um if you wanted to go with this some sort of a phase in where you would say we need to have a an ability to give legacy approval to the acceptable existing gravel driveways and say that anything going forward will meet the new bylaw. Um, but I also think you would need to have to define or let us define what properly constructed means. And in my mind, that would be kind of a 
two inches of gravel, at least eight feet wide by 20 feet long sort of thing. And then have a grace period basically where people could come in, register their existing, their longstanding gravel driveways prior to us requiring all driveways to be hard surfaced. So I, as I said in my email, I love this idea. I think it, I think it's great to get some of that really unsightly lawn parking out of the community. Um, it will take us probably, I would say this would be like a 2023 implementation of that particular component for us to do that properly and allow people the proper time to gain compliance in a, in a reasonable way. So that's my background on, on that additional context. Councilor Ross. I thank you, Mayor Creasy. So for direction, do you either want to start the process of Scott Dallas's note as a notice of motion to put the bylaw in place, or is this going to be a <clears throat> information come forward? I guess it's up to Councilor Dallas how he wants to pursue with this, but just for moving forward. And if I may, may also add, I, I agree with uh, Mayor Creasy and Councilor Gullickson that uh, quite frankly, we've been going over community standards since the beginning of the term, 217 term, because it was quite passionate of a lot of us that were new of feedback of citizens. And and Director Pichet got slammed pretty hard for the first 12 to 18 months of, this, of that term of council. So I, I guess for process this evening to say that we've succeeded in direction rather than going the farmer's market season once again and back to the drawing board once again, do we just go through the what are three, six points on the start of this item in the agenda and put forth some comments or if we, if we want change to say that we've accomplished something this evening. In other words, this is going to be brought back in October for really consideration for 2023 again. That's a I'm kind of like, what are we trying to accomplish here tonight? Because really, people still have the opportunity to discuss with the council or administration at the farmer's market anyways. They have it for years, and we've tried to make the effort of being more accessible. I think we've done that all that effort, but I agree with Councilor Connick. I was like, let's succeed something here tonight, and do we go through these six points and give an administration direction or are we just moving on and not accomplishing some tonight? Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess once again, not that I don't, I don't want input from the public. I just, somehow I think there seems to be an expectation we're gonna come up with a, a perfect uh, bylaw and those do not exist. And this will not be the last time it's changed. So I'm just, I wonder if we would be better off suited to perhaps thinking about moving forward at a little quicker pace. If you want to take some time, I just, I really don't know that it's going to be, if the input is going to warrant having a bunch of signage printed up and and uh, do the advertising and whatnot to garner that much more input at a farmer's market or other venue, whatever you decided for that, I just, I really don't think that that's been a barrier for people to have input is by not having it there or any other location. I think that people are very well uh, aware of how they can have input and they can certainly pick up the phone and talk to um, any counselor or myself uh, within reason most any time they want. So yeah, I, once again, if council feels strongly about having more input over the summer, I'm fine with it, but I just, I really don't know that it's going to have the kind of really positive or big changes that we may think are out there that we're hoping for. But in any event, uh, Councillor Connick brought up a good point, and I think that it would be in Council's best interest to give an indication of um, how we want to proceed. Otherwise, they're just going to be, we're either going to, on to the rest of the summer or we're going to mm -hmm. um, 
come up with changes in a little more uh, expediently. So what's everyone's thought on on uh, time frames and how you'd like to garner additional input, uh, if any? Councillor Ross? Uh, thank you, Mayor Creasy. I guess more I want to redirect. We have points here brought forth to us. What's not working? Like these are uh, comments brought forward to uh, coffee with council and and no system is perfect, no bylaw is perfect, but I still see a more positive direction in enforce some conversations, getting the message, I guess. And you know, <clears throat> if there's any concerns about trees, I think it was brought up earlier, if I recall by Councillor Hibbs, is uh, I notice on fifty first street a tree taken down in front of Michener like or I think a street on 40 and 50th in front of close to Councillor Hibbs residence of a tree been taken down in front of a duplex and some of these trees are really are kind of a they're landmarks of this community on certain streets I said so when we start talking trees is that an area that we need to protect with a bylaw our trees in our community but uh Sometimes, like, I guess what I'm asking is information, even from administration, is are any of these not working? If you enforce these points that we already have the bylaws in place, but more enforcement, is there something specific here that's not really working that needs that needs improved? Director Pichet, there's just a few uh, items that need to be amended. Like having a specific height of the trees in the alleyways is one of the areas. Right now, there's no current height that um, when they go to tell people to go and trim their trees to what height that they need to do. Um, anything within, of course, any power lines and stuff, that'll always be done by Fortis. But um, if we could just give some sort of a guideline to people of the overhangs, and then also on sidewalks, uh, we only allow, uh, if people are gonna put an extension cord over uh, a sidewalk of eight feet, that's what we would expect trees to be at. So that was one of the concerns from bylaw enforcement that they said they'd like something more specific there. Um, I know that weeds were not also included in um, the length of grass. So if we could include that into the uh, wording when we tell people to cut their, their vegetation, uh, not just grass, but to include something like weeds, um, because that'll help us with the control of noxious weeds versus just making sure that people are controlling the prohibited noxious weeds. So those, those are just some of them. And then of course, uh, we've had some uh, feedback regarding noise and uh, the, the um, areas where there's a, a cross between residential and commercial and um, that it's, it's problematic on one side or the other. And so for the uh, tree height, one that's listed here in the alleys, that was because of interference for Trash collection, was that the idea? Trash as well as RV trailers going through. And uh, there were times that they were getting scraped. And, and so that was something that allowed for that height to be uh, set at that uh, um, four meters. Thank you. Chief Gowdy. Um, also point number five, the 150 meter buffer um, for residential areas. For certain commercial snow clearing operations, that is uh, that has put us in a very unwinnable situation uh, when dealing with some of our local contractors who are also in this very tough spot uh, between violating the bylaw or providing the service required by their uh, by their customers. So. Perhaps you could just clear up some of the confusion over that. I know initially we had talked about um, um, high velocity blowers given their high uh, decibel output and snow removal in general because of backup beavers and that kind of thing. So um, where do we sit now and where's the proposal heading? Like what? Well, there hasn't been anything drafted in terms of amendments at this okay. point, so that would probably be the next step is if uh, we we were to draft some amendments and bring it to Council for decisions and del deliberation. Okay. It, is it fair to say that the majority of the noise complaints have been from high velocity blowers or not necessarily? No, it, it's mainly the heavy duty equipment okay. on parking lots. Yeah, okay. which makes it yeah interesting, doesn't it? Okay. 
Chief Cody. I, I would like to qualify the term majority. There's still no day. Well, one out of one constitutes a majority, a uh, significant majority. And I would say largely with both the blowers and the con the heavy clearing, um, we're dealing typically with a single repeat complainant, complainant uh, mm -hmm. about the nearby property. Councillor Hibbs. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Um, I wasn't going to bring this up as a point, but I will now in response to that. Um, keeping in mind that you will have a person that feels brave enough to go and challenge the system and kind of let you know about it, but you know that other people are feeling the same. They're just not comfortable trying to do something about it. Because honestly, I, t I don't know about you guys, but I talk to people that say that all the time. Like, I really hate this, but I've never gone to the city to complain about it because X, Y, Z, right? So, I mean, that's part of our role here is to try and anticipate that, look out for that. But anyways, that's not actually what I wanted to talk about. Um, what I wanted to ask was um, the anticipated timeline. So let's say, for example, that um, we decide not to hold off on this and that we do decide to pro start proceeding with um, bringing forward amendments. What would that look like? And I ask that because if we were to sort of take a, a leisurely uh, approach to that, would we be able to do it simultaneously where we're still able to do some public consultation because it's actually you know, actively happening now? Um, but also start moving the process through so that you potentially could have a new bylaw in order in place rather by say the end of June or something. Cause I, I'm asking this because I'm thinking, you know, you're going to head into the summer here right away. We all know how much happens over the summer because holidays and et cetera, et cetera. We have fewer meetings. Like there's just lots of factors there. Right. So, so that would be my question is what is, what is the timing that you were anticipating if you were to move on this, immediately and then is that a possibility where you can sort of balance a little bit more engagement but still achieving your goal chief Cody? um i <clears throat> i i would actually say either do the to give us direction this evening and we can prepare it for sort of the nearest oper uh, possible opportunity or to wait until after summer and, and not do multiple, I'm not sure if that's what you intended, but multiple bylaw uh, amendments. I do think there are certain components that are more likely to generate interest at, with further consultation than others, and that you could kind of lock in and winnow down the number of issues we're talking about. So for example, I, I think I even listed the example of like this tree thing in the alleys um, and over sidewalks. Everybody who hears that is, is said, yeah, that sounds good. We've had no negative feedback from that. And so to me, that one, I think you set to the side and say, yeah, that's fine. And maybe narrow this down to my uh, opinion, fewer, you know, just a, a handful. If, if there are those ones that you want a little more consultation on, perhaps this one, um, Councillor Dallas has raised. That might be something for a, a conduct a, a bit of further consultation with the goal to adopt the bylaw still uh, in the early fall, have it in place with all of the, with all of the changes. Because the majority of these changes actually aren't going to affect the way we enforce over the summer. I would say with the possible. Trees and meats. Change of the length of grass or weeds. If, if if council were to reduce that to six inches, that would definitely result in some additional enforcement and orders and stuff. Uh, is that fair? Yeah. So I know the whole snow removal and noising isn't exactly top of mind for everybody this time of year, thankfully. The one thing that I would say is that those that are affected by the heavy equipment backup beavers is a far less uh, or a far lower frequency. You're only going to have heavy machinery moving snow a handful of times a year or whatever, whereas the potential for someone to use um, the, the blower is in all likelihood to be far more often. So I could see where that could be annoying for 
some citizens. So that, that would be the one thing that I thought was a somewhat of a difference in that regard. Um, so with respect to the timing, there's kind of been some talk on both sides here. So we should get a better feel for, like, is this something that we would like to try and move along in the next, um, I don't know, pick a number, month or two, or is this something that we have no problem with taking till the end of of summer and doing it in the fall? What's what's uh, everyone's wishes? We're not doing motions and stuff here, of course, at the committee meeting, but I think we definitely need some some direction that uh, that gives our administration a a target to shoot for. Councillor Dallas, would you look here to start? Well, uh, being new and finding out that you guys have been working on this for some time, I think just from what I'm hearing, kind of consultations kind of maxed out. I think maybe uh, as uh, CAO Gowdy said, maybe a couple points we could set aside to just say these ones we really want to focus on, but the rest of these plan to move forward with. Um, otherwise, I'm... I'm at a loss to choose a timeline for it just based on the, the amount of time that everyone has been working on it previously. Um, so I would be satisfied with moving forward immediately, but I'm also willing to accept a few items need more time. Thank you. Councilor Ross. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. In order to meet third reading, we would need by the first council meeting in June to, to have third reading passed, would we not? Or is that like if it take two meetings to make amend to is a do you need third reading for amendments or is it just one meeting to amend? Um, you still need three readings, uh, which you're right. Barring some sort of unanimous extraordinary circumstance vote that uh, requires at least two meetings. So therefore, then it would have to be by the first meeting in June to finish by the end of June, as Councillor Ibbs was alluding to, to be done by the end of June. Well, it wouldn't necessarily have to be, but traditionally this council is not apt to consider th three uh, in one evening by, by special resolution, so it would take some time. Do you have any thoughts on specific timing? Can, can I ask what's the date of this first meeting in June to, to give specific time? Sorry. I... Sorry, Mayor Creasy. Certainly, uh, Coordinator Bellabono, go ahead. Yes, the first meeting, I believe, is June 6th. There's also another meeting on June 13th, I believe. Thank you. Chief Cotty? Um, one of those is a committee meeting. I believe the 6th is the committee meeting. And so you can't pass anything at the committee meeting. The 13th and the 27th? Uh, can you confirm that there are two council meetings scheduled? Yes, sorry. The June 6th meeting actually is a committee of the whole meeting. The June 13th meeting is a regular meeting, and the June 27th meeting was actually canceled previously. Okay. So the so, following meeting after that would be July 11th, I believe. So on, on our agenda today, it says that it's a, a regular, but it's actually a committee. This is an Thank you. Appreciate that uh, correction. Uh, Councillor Connick, what's your thoughts on timing? I say we tackle all of it. I don't want to mess around with this in the fall. Get it all done then by uh, coming to Council on the 13th for first and second, and then we'll finish it up at that first meeting in July. But to tackle all of it, including Councillor Dallas's, would be my thoughts. Thank you. I um, saw some looks over here. <laughs> Councillor Gullickson. Waiting for you to come around, but okay. I'll go now. Right. Sure. Okay. I have no issues with that. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. I agree with uh, Councillor Connick. Let's get it done. Councillor Hibbs. Thank you. Yeah, I can live with that. I just didn't want it to be all wrapped up at the end of May, and that would just be too fast for me. Um, but I do still want, I would like to see some additional like efforts made to try and solicit um, information from the public, whether that be through the social media. And then also, you know, we have farmers markets coming up in that period. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we could probably do a few of them. We don't have to do them all, um, but I think that that would be um, 
why not? You know, we have the time and then we can truly say that we've given it all and um, everybody's had an opportunity. Councillor Hoekstra. I agree with Councillor Connick and I guess the why not on the farmer's market is the signage. Do we do we want to make signage just for two markets? I would say not. Uh, can I speak to that? Sorry. Certainly. No, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Mayor Creasy, the signage was made last time in about 10 minutes. Was that not correct? We had a special sign made that we didn't have one and they zipped back to the office and got it done. I, it, we printed it ourselves and then put it on one, on the sandwich board. It was, and it was great. It was perfect and cost us next to nothing. Certainly would be an option. And we could also in 10 days and we could whip up something on core plast as well. So. Well, I don't think we'd need that because I mean, every market might, we might want a different opinion, right? So I think you could just do it because that, and that sign, that signage turned out great. I was really surprised and I thought, why are we spending this money? Because we can print it and just put it right on there and call it good. So for myself, I would prefer a little sooner as later. I'm not opposed to having some input. I just, I think I would expect to see more input if there was some proposed changes brought forward because to expect people to absorb the entire thing and they're at the end the entire bylaw and come up with uh, input is rather ambitious and probably not real realistic so uh, if we here's the here's the changes what do you think that may garner some input but it, let's not be dragging this all, all the way through summer and taking forever on it is that sufficiently vague to mess administration up or um yeah i'm not really clear what we're doing i would say uh that, that'd be a no <laughs> so <laughs> we are happy to go either way if we're looking to draft a bylaw like right now the signage we've had for coffee with council for example it does list just the five issues uh very targeted i i didn't actually look at our social media posts i'm not on social media as much uh, so, but can you tell us whether it was like a, the bylaws being reviewed? Go to this and give us comments, or was it here's some potential changes we're considering with the bylaw? That's got to make you feel good that you didn't look at them because no one else did either. There was zero comments. It was it was issue specific, so we broke it down into specific issues. Okay, so I I would say that has been the approach. We. Definitely, we'll continue that approach and make sure they're very issue specific and say, hey, do you care about grass? Here's the here's what we're thinking about grass. Um, so if if you'd like to see us continue the consultation, that's the way we would go. I, I guess I haven't weighed in administratively on like, do, should we open it or we didn't feel like the consultation resulted in a lot of meaningful decision making information that was going to help you. And so we said, well, I guess let's let's give it, give it some more time. Our preference is actually always to just get direction and go ahead and, and bring it back to you and see what you think. Um, so we're happy to go either way. Uh, I would like to see some sort of. Which one? Fair enough. So farmers markets, um, exterior ones begin when? Mid-May. Mid-May? Yeah, so I'd have how, to confirm. So how about uh, you've got two farmers, the first two farmers markets for consultation and after that we move along. Is that, does that generally capture the intent of council for uh, trying to ascertain where our community is at with respect to community bylaws and still not cost us the entire summer working on it. Is that a, is everybody equally unhappy with that compromise? Is that reasonable enough direction, Chief Cody? It is, I just wanna confirm from what I gather, there's general uh, support or at least consulting the, the public on Councillor Dallas's suggested no lawn parking type um, 
clause. Is that yeah. fair? As long as we've got appropriate uh, lines for the people to line up to oppose that. I mean, seriously, who, who's you're not going to be in opposition to that. I mean, come on. But whatever, yeah, go ahead. You you got you got two you got two two farmers markets to do it, and then let's move on. Problem. Any any additional any additional uh, councillor Connick? So now that we've determined we're going to do this quickly, did you want to go around the table to go over the five points? When everyone's thoughts are so that admin knows where they're at with that. No, but I sure will. Would you care to start? I would be happy to start. Very good. Point one trees and alleys and sidewalks. I agree with the recommendations put forward in terms of heights. Eight feet in the alleys or eight feet on sidewalk and whatever height you recommended. I think that's terrific. Uh, weeds uh, and grass. I think we're kind of lumping these together. I'm fine with the eight inches. I'm like Councilor Gullix and I let my grass go a little bit longer, so I might be the first violator because as soon as I cut it, it burns. So I'm not a quick grass cutter. I think the eight inches is fine, so I don't think we need to tackle that. Vegetation on sidewalks. <clears throat> this one I don't I don't think this the owner the owner should be on the homeowner myself. I think there's a few problem areas in town, and some of them I think are kind of public sidewalks, kind of, you know. There's a couple of properties that spring to our areas on 58th Street, for example, and I'm just trying to think. Is that something the city should be looking after or the private homeowner? So I think I think really honestly, I think um, that responsibility lies with the city. I think there's a few problem areas and I think we just send a few people through there and clean it up every so often. And I think I think that the snow thing makes sense to me, but this doesn't. Noise, I'm with the mayor. I think uh, commercial heavy equipment. I mean, if you're buying a home that borders a commercial property, there's some expectation. If you don't have that expectation, you're kidding yourself. But I think there's some expectation that there'll be a few times a month where you're going to hear backup alarms and so forth. And it's annoying, but it's just, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. And that was mentioned here. I do have an issue, I think, with the handheld snowblowers. I think if we can be very specific about that and say, look, you can't before 7 a.m. operate a handheld snowblower. Great. But the heavy equipment, I, these guys got to do their jobs too. And I, it doesn't happen, as the mayor said, every day. And then the unsightly premise one, I don't, I think that's dangerous ground. I'm not in support of that whatsoever, telling people when they should fix their property or not, and who's to determine what's, what's, what's an eyesore and what isn't. And Again, I only I can only cite my own. I had a pressure treated wood fence and I made the mistake of painting it a few years ago and now I have to paint it every two, three years. And sometimes I let it go a few extra years and it starts to look a little shabby, but I don't need the city to come tell me to paint it. Uh, you know, I'll get it when I get it. And then Councilor Dallas says, I support that one. I just, I think we need clarification on this. I don't have a problem actually with gravel driveways. There's lots in town now. I, I know we, we talked about this briefly at one point. I think we just have to, you know, you grandfather those in. I, I think the biggest issue, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councilor Nass, I think the biggest issue with this is there are people who park fifth wheels on their front lawn. I don't know if that's what you're trying to address here. That kind of, I don't quite understand that. So I don't know if it's about so much about they have to have a hard surface or proper driveway more than can't park on your front lawn. I don't know. I don't know if that's as simple as that or what. So I think that we need to flesh that one out. So I think there's some merit there or something that needs to be figured out there. I don't know what it is yet. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Councillor Ross. I'll keep it going. Uh, the trees in the alleys, I think the alley needs to be a higher height than the sidewalk. Uh, the height of trailers and your, your garbage truck is higher than eight feet. And I think it's still going to be uh, damaged I guess, or anyways. I was going to say it's 13 feet for alleys, though, right? I'm sorry. I thought somebody said eight. My The sidewalk's eight. Um, okay. My apologies. Sorry about that. <laughs> anyways, I'm moving on classification of weeds. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I think there's probably some more more specific there. Uh, the kids, uh, I think there's been areas that the city's expressed to include and not include, or the definition. Uh, length of grass and weeds, uh, I support including the weeds as well because then you're just 
that's you're covering the wording. Uh, length, uh, uh, I want to probably, I'd leave it as is, but then eight inches by the time, the time you enforce it becomes very significant. You know, on the, on the, it's just because you got your seven days of notice, your other days of this, 10 more days on top of already eight inches, but you're, how do you enforce the less to, I guess it's getting uh, that, I don't know. Uh, it's just the, the time duration of enforcement being the extra 10 days, it's just the starting point, especially at repetition properties. I would probably support six, but you're going to get a lot of negative. You're going to get, but I would support just leave it as is because it's either way you're not winning. Uh, vegetation on the sidewalks, I, I would agree that I think uh, not the majority of sidewalks, I think within the city, they're either repaired or I think they could be, in my, my opinion, they can be addressed by patrol and requesting that to be sprayed. Uh, I know it's going to going to require more man hours, but uh, I think there is an effort to replace the problem sidewalks that need replaced or addressed. Uh, noise from commercial snow clearing. Uh, if there's a distant change that makes it easier for administration, I would support that. But if you reside near commercial or business property, you know, and, and, and there are examples where individuals have a business within their own home, within other businesses, that is your choice. There's pros and cons to every choice you make in the location where you live. So I would, I would think it's adequate, but if the administration has something that makes the enforcement or easier for administration, I would be open to that. And on setting premise enforcement, where do you draw the line of heart and pride and ownership? I guess, in my opinion, I would just like to enforcement of the grass and weeds to and keeping your clean. You're trying to enforce upon somebody if they can, whether what can they can afford to do. I don't. I think that's getting too far. So I don't support that. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, Councilor Dallas, I do support that, I, but I do agree with uh, CEO Gaudi in terms of from this point forward, there's way too many to, I, think I agree with the uh, permanent parking would be from this point forward. And if they're parking on gravel now, but I do agree there's concerns of parking RVs on grass and or vehicles that are you know, I think there's some some examples where there's vehicles that are inoperable that are parked in front of grass that, that there's already bylaws in place for that. So, but in other words, I do support uh, Councillor Dallas's. Councillor Gullickson, you ready? I'm ready. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with the trees in the alleys and sidewalks, keeping them cut down or enforcing that anyway, if it's the homeowner's trees, right? They, they'll come and do it, but they'll be charged for that is that correct um we would first ask them to do it ask with all the tools available <laughs> to us yeah. nicely ask them to do it and then if they don't do it we cut it and then we charge them for it right then that's happened in a few cases so i totally agree with that for safety reasons uh the classification of weeds to be enforced through the bylaw i mean there's some weeds out there that need to be watched in on our lands also on city property uh length of grass and weeds if we include weeds in that then we're going to be in violation ourselves all over the place because the weeds are this high and the grass is this high on there so does that become an issue for the city because we're in violation of our own bylaw so who's going to enforce that nobody's going to come and do that to us so i i don't really think we should include that Vegetation and sidewalks, certainly there's some areas that require the city to address, but the majority of that should be done by the homeowners. And noise from a com commercial snow clearing, I believe is uh, something that's just a huge problem for certain people and others, it doesn't really bother them. And if it's snow removal, I think that's, you know, maybe a couple times a month or three times, depending on snowfall. and. I think most people would be understandable, but the leaf blowers are an issue for me. They do make quite a bit of noise and 
I have a bit of a problem with that. And especially when they're out there and they don't need to be there until eight o'clock in the morning or even seven 30. Um, so unsightly premises. Um, I am passionate about that one a little bit that I think there should be some enforcement on that when there's eavesdrops falling off and different things happening. And some of them are dangerous in the one case it's, there's fencing falling off and nails sticking up and things like that. So I think there should be some enforcement there. As far as painting, I don't, uh, my fence needs to be stained. Uh, Karen doesn't want it stained, so I'm not doing it, but <laughs> and I don't know why I've offered a number of times, but uh, I'm in the same position as Ruben where, uh, I mean, somebody could determine that as being unsightly and think that it should be, but there is, there is limits. I don't know how we enforce that. I really don't. It's a hard one. And then as far as the parking on the grass or out, off your driveway, I completely agree with that. But I know there's certain, there's areas where people, that's all they've got. And it would be hard to enforce that too if they say, well, either that or park on the street. So it's a tough one, but I, I would support us pursuing that to have them at least have an area that is graveled and I would not have make them pave it in my opinion they shouldn't have to but a graveled area should be fine thank you and as far as municipal tickets I believe those all have to be paid by the director do they not yeah yeah but she won't pay she says put it on my taxes really? oh wait a minute <laughs> who's who's ready to go next Councillor Dallas go ahead okay. thank you Mayor Tracy uh, item one, full support of that uh, for the tree height. Item two, weed classification to be enforced. Uh, yeah, I, uh, sorry, review. I am in support of that. And number three, reduction of the length of grass. This one I too struggle with. Uh, I don't know if two inches makes a difference or not. It seems like the properties that have been identified. We are already have investigated and told them that they are on our inspection list. So I don't see a need to go beyond that. Um, so that one, I am not interested in pursuing uh, making it shorter. Uh, residents responsible for controlling vegetation on growth and sidewalks. I am in support of that. I think the the biggest thing is I'm just not expecting to people to go out there, spray the weed killer, and then be scraping dirt and roots out of sidewalks that have cracked over time from degradation. So I think just if they're mowing them and keeping them gra uh, down at concrete level, then great. Uh, elimination of the 150 buffer requirement. You know, I think uh, the comment's been brought up multiple times. You live near a commercial area. There are some expectations on uh, noises in that area. So I support uh, item five. Item six, enforcing standards. This one I struggled with. It seems like it's kind of a tax on people who are less fortunate. And so unless we have systems in place to support them to change the deterioration and improve, then I don't think we can push that. And then as for my parking, yes, I am in support of that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, Councillor Connick brought up a good point, just no parking on grass. So I, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hibbs. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Um, so trees and alleyways and over sidewalks, I, I just think that's a no brainer. I do have a question regarding sidewalks. However, being somebody who walks a lot, um, especially when people have like uh, trees, shrubs, hedges are the worst on, on front streets, like it encroaches so much into the sidewalk that even to walk as a single person, never mind having a, a partner to walk through with, um, can be impossible in places and that really um, bothers me so would that be something that would be um, considered as well okay and also for height of say shrub, um, not shrubs but hedges in particular when they're in the front correct me if I'm wrong but there is somewhere that limits how high that's meant to be right and it's it's quite short isn't it like four feet three feet something I believe it's three feet if it's at the front of the, okay. the area uh, it's specific around um, 
the traffic and being able to see around traffic okay. corners and such. And, and that's that's probably in the land use bylaw rather than this bylaw. But I, I'm sure I've seen it somewhere. I just can't remember. It but might be the traffic bylaw. I well, have to double. -check. I'm just putting it out there. I don't necessarily need a response, but just something to sort of sort of think about when drafting amendments. Um, classification of weeds to be enforced through bylaw. Yeah, I don't have a, a problem with that one that I can recall off the top of my head. Length of grass and weeds. I don't think that. I know eight inches is problematic for some people. I don't actually think it's overly problematic, but I do think that when we're talking about the height, it should be grass and weeds, right? Um, and I think that that comes uh, to incorporate as well. Like when you've got weeds on public property, like eight inches is pretty tall. Like that's a pretty tall dandelion. So I should hope that we're, you know, getting it addressed by that point, right? I don't, well, I guess sometimes. Um, Vegetation and sidewalks, do I necessarily think that homeowners should be responsible for that? Eh, probably not, but I do actually think that that's something that we as a city should decide that is, you know, not acceptable and and tackle. So whether that takes city resources to do whatever, but I mean, it does help. Um, it causes damage to the sidewalk, right? Like it makes it worse, right? So um, I think that we should be doing that. Now, that being said, uh, at the same time, sort of as we were talking about encroachment of, you know, hedges and whatever, you have situations, especially in some of the older areas where the grass is really growing onto the sidewalk. And again, the sidewalk is disappearing. And so whose problem is that? And I don't think that actually should be the city's. I think that should be um, the homeowner or property owner. So I guess that would be a consideration. Um, I know I'm su sounding super anal, but but when you do as much walking as I do, it, that's problematic even for snow clearing in the winter because now you don't have a you know a hard surface. You've got all this vegetation in the way, right? Um, noise from commercial snow clearing. I commented on this in the past. I honestly think the whole purpose in that and purpose and intent in that was to address those terrible snow blower like handheld things, not the clearing, occasional clearing of a, of a commercial parking lot, as was mentioned by Mayor Creasy and others, that so periodically happens over the course of a winter that it's just not, I don't think, reasonable to expect that you're just not ever going to be disturbed by that. It's, it's like having snow clearing operations in the downtown core. If you happen to live there and you know, the city has to has to clear those streets at some point. Well, they're not going to do it during the workday. They're going to do it at night. And and that's, but again, how often does that happen? It's not so often that it's that cumbersome. I don't think that it's an undue burden. Um, unsightly premises, I would agree with most of what's being said here that that is difficult. And I completely agree with that it does put an extra burden on those that are perhaps maybe not in a position financially to be able to address um, that as much as others. I would say, however, um, with the exception of things that are safety issues, right? So in a, in a property that is particularly derelict, like a, a building or whatever, those provides are, you know, safety um, concerns, right? And I, and I think that that maybe should be considered. Um, let's see what else have I got here. Um, then the last one was the parking. So um, my thoughts on that is uh, I do think that we should pursue some sort of idea there because I've seen it before. I've lived next to a house that used to do that on occasion and I didn't understand it. Um, and so I think that if you've got sort of a designated area that's that's parking, you know, even if it's gravel, if it's an existing thing, I'm kind of okay with that um, with the exception of and we sort of briefly touched on it, at least some of us had, what do you have when you have a property that's completely gravel, the whole front yard? Like, is the whole front yard a, a parking lot, like lot, essentially? Like, no, that that isn't acceptable. When I see a big heavy truck parked, like, in the front yard, haphazardly, like, that that looks wrong to me, and it looks wrong to other residents. And that's, especially when it's on a, on a main road, that's just, it's, it's not, I don't think, what we want in our community. And then it was also mentioned, and you see it quite often, especially with RVs, is being parked on um, like grassy side yards. So whether that's in your fence, just outside your fence, you know what I mean? Like whose property is that? It's kind of the city's, it's kind of not. But like I see it repeatedly where somebody has a sizable chunk of property either adjacent to the property or they think it's part of their property. They just set up their RV there and pop open the awning and sometimes people are staying in it for a little while. Like, and again, I don't think that's the idea. I don't think that's appropriate um, for our community. So 
those would be my thoughts. Thank you, Councillor Hoekstra. I don't think I have much to add. Anyhow, I was going to be that person. I, I truly don't have tons to add. I wanted the grass to be six inches, but obviously that's, I'm a minority there. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll throw that out there. Because when I think this is eight inches, that's pretty tall. But just saying. Um, and I really, I, I don't agree with number six either. I think that one would be hard to enforce. And I do support Councillor Dallas's idea to not park on the front yard. In my little walk, I think there's three three vehicles in my area that park on the grass. So that's all I have. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Just me. Uh, number one, overhang for trees, yes. Classification of weeds, yes. Reduction of length of grass. I have no problem with that. I think that would expedite things a little bit for bylaw. I don't. Not a, not a huge one. I think it might make life easier for them, so I'm in favor of that. Uh, residents' responsibility for controlling vegetation on and in sidewalks. No, that should be a city responsibility. Um, the buffer, once again, I'm of the opinion for the uh, under the noise uh, portion to eliminate the use of the high speed, high decibel and held units. Prior or prior to a given time, what that time is, I don't know, but it's yeah. um, forcing standards for the buildings. I think that is extremely difficult one to get behind for me. I, as much as I would like to see everybody property in in uh, uh, good shape, I I just don't think that's a reasonable expectation for every single property, and I do support some sort of by law to accommodate the front yard parking situation in some areas. All well, that's worded. I have no input at this time, though. Everybody else is spent. So there, that shouldn't take too long to go through and collate uh, 35 different sets of inputs here. So our items. Chief Gowdy. I just had a couple of <clears throat> responses to things that Councillor Hoekstra, uh, sorry, Councillor Hibbs have brought up. Um, the site triangle requirements are only at corners, and so there is no restriction on the height of a hedge on the front of your property uh, in land use bylaw or otherwise, unless you are restricting sight li lines for safety reasons. Um, I was smiling about your the hedge pushing you and the uh, grass, Diane knows, or sorry, Director B. Shane knows why. Uh, I frequently complain about that and, and have them enforce, and we actually have a whole project and plan to address that starting in 2023. Uh, that very thing, it's so prevalent though, that addressing it, what we've discovered is that addressing it on a case by case basis, we would be behind by the time we finished. And so we have to go with a more widespread approach and then target some. The, the remaining sort of bad properties, but we we do have a uh, plan for that. Um, yeah, and that, I just want to talk about the hedge hedges for a second. And so to be clear for those watching at home, then there is no height uh, limit for vegetation in your front yard, other than if it is within the sight lines as defined in the bylaw, correct? The, the traffic bylaw. Correct, uh, unless, you pass a change and right. then the currently those. Um, there is, though existing, it is enforceable for the hedge to not be coming over the sidewalk. Uh, what we might consider would be saying that there has to be a six inch sort of buffer from the sidewalk back because invariably when we enforce, someone comes and cuts it right on the sidewalk. Like, well, yeah, tomorrow it's going to be back over the sidewalk. So having a cutback actually might be something we would uh, look at. Thank you. I think we can move on to the next item. Saw some smiles of uh, relief there. Director LaPointe, item 4.2, the International Association of, of Public Participation Overview, please. Mouthful. Yeah. Well, good evening, Mayor Creasy and Council. 
This evening administration is providing an overview of the International Association of Public Participation or IAP2 Spectrum Council's review and discussion. You may recall the most recent iteration of the city's public participation policy was approved in 2018. Administration has scheduled this policy for renewal in 2023. It has already implemented changes to the council meeting templates, incorporating a snapshot of the spectrum and a brief description of recommended public participation activities to be undertaken with the corresponding project. This evening's discussion, administration is sharing a review of the spectrum as it forms the basis for organized and thoughtful public participation. This report looks to increase familiarity with the spectrum to advance ongoing alignment between council and administration on public participation initiatives. Public participation utilizes a range of activities to support council decision making. Community empowerment increases along the spectrum as you move from left to right. At its furthest left point is the inform heading. Uh, these activities are focused on providing information to the public on council decisions. There really is no public involvement in the process for these items. However, citizens are made aware of council's direction. So informing is really one way communication. This can take the form of social media posts, fact sheets, publications, and municipal records, just to name a few examples. The next point on the spectrum involves consulting. Council essentially performs a check-in or generates feedback on a specific issue. There's no requirement for council to act based on the consultation feedback received. However, there is a need to respond to those consulted on how the input influenced the decision. Examples of consultation include surveys, for us, coffee with council. Again, social media co uh, comments if there's back and forth um, and public open houses. At the center of the IAP2 spectrum stands involvement. Uh, involvement seeks to ensure public uh, concerns and needs are incorporated into the alternatives being developed and decisions made. Um, in this case, the process is facilitated still by the city, working together with citizens to ensure their needs and concerns are met. So the most recent R4 district review that's still ongoing at this point is a great example of an involvement activity. Typically, these activities are workshop based with a short term lifespan. Collaboration looks to use public input to maximize it uh, to, to the maximum extent possible. While council still has the final decision-making authority in this instance, committees and community groups work to build recommendations for council's review and approval. Topics are usually assigned to internal committees or boards for consideration, and the results of those discussions are passed along to council for ratification. So in this instance, uh, some examples are the downtown area redevelopment plan committee, the affordable housing steering committee, and the Lacoma District Recreation Parks and Culture Board. Discussion and ideas are generated by community uh, committee members and brought forward again to, to council for consideration. So again, not led by um, administration, but really led by the community. And then lastly, empowerment delegates responsibility to another set of stakeholders. In this situation, council looks to outside agencies and community groups to make decisions regarding city funding. Uh, Lacombe FCSS, Lacombe Regional Tourism, and Echo Lacombe are all empowered by council to make decisions regarding city funding or assets. So just a few follow-up general statements worth noting. Uh, most public participation resides in the inform and consult portions of the spectrum, at least right now they do. Uh, some projects will require elements from multiple categories, so it's not like you just have to live in one category. Um, and then there's other projects that will involve many activities within one stated section of the spectrum. So you might not just want to do surveys. You might want to do coffee with council or a few other items in the consultation section of the spectrum. And again, finally, as we move to the right, citizen participation, the process grows, but so does the uh, resourcing requirements oftentimes until you get to the empowerment stage where, again, that's handed off to another organization or committee. So it's a high level review of the IAP2 spectrum. And with that, I'm open to any questions or comments you may have. Thanks, Director of the Point. Councillor Gibbs. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Um, thank you for that. I do really appreciate um, that we've started to see these little, I don't know, icons or whatever you want to call it on, on memos um, starting a little while back. Um, this is definitely something that I feel very passionate about public engagement and I think it is a good idea to very clearly state what type of public engagement that we're doing on on different topics. Um, the only thing that I 
have thought of since I've started seeing these on memos is that I know that it says underneath like the city has consulted or plans to consult or whatever the case may be, for example, to use that as, as one of the examples. But I, I think that it, I would like it and maybe it's just not practical, but if you know how you have the different, the five different ones there, they all have their different colors. Is there a way to either gray out the ones that are not applicable in this case or put a little red box around the one that is being done just to make it just really obvious because I, I feel we go through all the effort of putting it there, but then it's not really obvious um, which one it is that we're, that we're doing. Chief Cody. Um, so I, again, we did have actually a similar, we, we tried a number of ways. Uh, what we came to is it actually is very difficult to do that both it could be done on a case by case basis, but what happens is that uh, there are many times when you may have informed the general public, but you've consulted a subset of people. So, for example, uh, land use uh, decisions. You've consulted within 60 meters, but maybe you've informed the entire community about the decision. And so it you'd end up with sometimes three boxes and and I. If it were easy to do so. Uh, I think the value would be there. Given how challenging it was to actually create that kind of um, ease, I, I we came to the conclusion that it wasn't worth it. Okay. Anyone else? Not nearly the conversation that there is with this as there was bylaws. You're getting off light. <laughs> Not a problem. Looks like everybody's good. All right, uh, CAO Gowdy, the legislative structure and data integrity next, please. So the item of the evening in my opinion. <laughs> so today. Uh, but I know this isn't everyone's passion, I guess. Uh, so feel free to kind of tune out if you don't want to. But I <laughs> I actually am very, this is the most exciting phase of the project for me. Um, this data integrity project from the beginning has been one I, I am quite passionate about um, because it's about getting the community ready for the next stage of growth, which really is, we're starting to see it now. Um, Really between that sort of 15,000 and 20,000, the community will tr will transform um, in some good ways and some not so good ways. Uh, and one of the one of the things that we want to make sure we're doing is setting up the city's governance uh, structure in a way that will facilitate good decision making and efficiency for council when they're looking at these. Right now, you've you have such an accretion of various policy level items and and there it's kind of a mishmash of what lies where um that it actually does hamper you and administration in a number of ways um and so although this may not seem like an urgent thing and it isn't necessarily urgent it is something that's really important and as we continue to grow um, i think this will serve the community well so what we have done uh, of course, as many of you will recall, in the first two phases, we repealed over a thousand bylaws and then just over 1500 policies in phase two. And those were bylaws and policies that when we looked at them, they were completely ineffective. And so there was no, there was no value lost by a complete repeal of those policies and bylaws. We still have uh, what we're left with, I guess, is a mix of some highly effective policies and some that have effective components that are policy level guidance and may have other components in them that are much more administrative in nature and, and actually hamper action in some uh, ways, hamper efficient action. So, 
Right now, we have this list of approximately 200 of those policies, directives, guidelines. They're, they're named various things, and, and we do have some that go the other way, where um, we've discovered things that have been passed administratively that actually ought to have been uh, policy level things. And so we'd like to separate those out. We have actually gone through and delineated exactly how we recommend that happening. Uh, there's an attached sheet to your report to committee that contains all of the uh, approximately 200 items and then says it currently is, for example, a, a council policy and we recommend that being a council policy and a administrative directive or whatever that may be. So before going through that work, which is going to take years probably, um, we would like to get your stamp of approval on the proposed framework of how we're going to structure um, those different governance documents. And so the current state, I, I've outlined some of the issues that we have with our current policies where there's um, things that prevent them from being as effective of governance documents as they should be. So the first one I've highlighted and, and I really have just given some examples here. But I would encourage you if you are interested, just go to your policy website and, or, and, and click any of them. And chances are very good that you're going to come across some. Some interesting, some interesting things, whether it's very detailed policies or overlapping policies. And so that's what we've highlighted here. Um, we do have these overlapping policies where you have some areas um, I think I've highlighted the naming of things you actually have three policies that are not entirely overlapping but there are certain components there that if I were a developer coming in trying to produce a proposal that had all the naming that would match the city's policies there are certain components where I would find that impossible to do so that to satisfy one I would be unable to satisfy the other um, you have similarly, if you look at the Missioner recreation area there, you have, I don't know, eight or nine policies around something that it's really just one topic. If I'm a member of the public and I want to access information about Missioner Park, I'm going to go to one, I, I want one spot that has all the information. And if I'm administration, there's actually, again, in this Missioner policy, there's some overlap between some of the policies and so you have this thing where you have to actually check every single policy and make try to make sure you have all the you amend it correctly um the cemetery is another one that we have i think half a dozen policies on various components of how to operate the cemetery um, we have these policies that are lacking in what i would call policy level direction um, so things that talk about actually we came across one today that we're where it specifically says um, it's for the reserve for the reserve uh, uh, policy we're supposed to do a re review of the reserve policy and actually unfortunately your reserve policy says it shall be the director of corporate services that uh, reviews your reserves and produces a report every year or every two years but of course Diane's not the best one to, one to do that. Uh, we have senior manager McKinnon, uh, a certified accountant. And so that actually I'm violating, violating pol council policy, just asking a different staff member to do it. And you have similar things on the way we check the ice thicknesses on stormwater ponds and how we book the ice center or how we take deposits at the LMC and who takes the cash and where it's stored. Very, very specific stuff um, that really should not be in. A council policy. Um, similarly, when we look back to some of the actions we took to address some of the pandemic restrictions, many of them were actually not client with council policy and, and we did have a discussion about that at one point uh, early ish in the pandemic when we said hey i'm i'm taking some action here that i don't think actually is totally 
administrative entirely because of the way your policy framework is. And, and so at that time, was gracious and said, no, that's that's fine. We understand dealing with uh, unknown conditions. So continue on. But that really shouldn't be, that's not a desirable spot to be in uh, for council or um, administration. We also have a number of human resource policies, which are kind of awkward when the CAO bylaw, well, actually uh, the, the structure of council is that you have one employee. And so you're really, by adopting council directed HR policies, you're really setting policy for staff not employed by the council um, and that you've already delegated that authority through your CAO bylaw to make those work conditions and job descriptions. And I think I referenced one that says what type of footwear is needed for different jobs within the, within the municipality. And it just, it really is not something that Councils ought to be at the policy level. And, and so when I look at um, the staff training and development policy was a, was a good one. It says, you know, these employees have this much allocated and these employees have this much allocated. These employees have this much allocated. Oh, and the CAO can move them around whenever you want. And you know, it's kind of a pool thing. <coughs> well, that's not really a policy because at the end of the day, we come and say, budget, would like $100,000 for staff training and development, and council may say, actually, it's a tight year, 50,000. Or, yeah, you know, we really want to see additional investments, so 120,000. And then once we get that, we're not limited to 800 per staff. Some staff do 400, some staff may do 1,200, depending on the needs of the municipality at the time and, and how we can uh, schedule that training, that sort of thing. And so this, it does lead to some challenges um, and a lot more policy than is, is required at the council level. Now, one of the things that I would feel if I was council that I would want sort of explicitly stated to me, so I will, um, at no point are we going to, is this going to be used as an attempt to make changes without council's or to circumvent council's uh, proper decision-making authority. We completely understand that many of these policies that I've just talked about even may be things that council wants to be aware of, if not directly involved in the actual machinations of each thing. And so when we structured our proposed framework, <clears throat> uh, we ensured that we would have reporting to council on, um, on anything that might be of interest. And so, those have been proposed as administrative policies. And, uh, the proposed framework that we've developed comes out of a review of our existing um, mishmash of uh, guidance and some reviews of those municipalities who have adopted official governance document frameworks and what's worked well for them. Um, the majority of where we found these, of course, is in larger municipalities, which makes, makes sense. They have the capacity to do that. Um, and the need to do so as we're starting to see. And so what we have proposed is attached to the document um, as attachment number one. So we have, what we've done is laid out a sort of a five level governance policy framework with a fifth being code of practice that's kind of off to the side, I would say. Um, and then we've we've got some examples of what would be a good at uh, good at that policy governor, sorry, at that governance document level, uh, specific to bylaws, council policy, administrative policies, and so on. And then we've got council's access and approval um, role. So council's sort of role in each governance level and what the general, whether it's an outward facing thing, is it a inward facing thing? And, and so I'll go through that just at a high level now. So of course, starting off is, is bylaws. Those are things that you can demand that people follow and find them and enforce if they do not. So they're typically, um, you're given the authority to pass these bylaws through the Municipal Government Act or some other provincial or national statute. Um, and they're fairly straight, they're fairly straightforward actually. Um, typically, they're very consistent between municipalities and there's a lot of 
um, existing jurisprudence around the enforcement of bylaws. Also, um, they require three readings to pass. They may involve a public hearing or other forms of debate. Only council can adopt them through that mechanism. And of course, they're publicly available on the website at all times. So they, we actually <clears throat> spent the least, least amount of time here. Um, you do have a fairly good bylaw structure in place. Council policy is something that council is uh, stating publicly. This is how the public can expect to receive service. This is how we're directing the administration to provide this service and, and how the administration will act. So it's an external statement about external expectations. Um, and of course, again, the uh, council role there, it's approved by council through resolution at a council meeting, and we keep all of our policies up on our website. Administrative policy is a new level. Um, this is something that is internally facing, but can have an external component. And so typically this is going to be uh, where council policy is something council is saying to the community. We're saying, here's what you can expect. Here's what we expect. The administrative policy is the CAO saying to both administration and potentially an external component. Here's how you can expect to receive service from the city. Here's how you can access service and here's how we'll be providing that that service that council has directed us to provide. Uh, sorry, and that um, council's role, you'd be notified of any amendments via CAO report within the council agenda, and you'd have the ability to direct uh, conversion of an administrative policy to a council policy if you so chose, or to direct specific changes to the administrative policy. Um, actually, the directive that I sent out on um, by law enforcement that you had requested uh, and sent out during this meeting, and that would be sort of a similar, probably similar level. Currently, our administrative directives, these are the CAO uh, saying specifically to, to a more targeted audience in the administration. So this would be a subset, not the entire administration um, as a body. Uh, here's how you will provide service. Here's how we will um, carry out these organizational decisions that have um, fall out of, out of council's strategic objectives, for example. And so we've got a number of examples there, such as the Land Developer Investment Engagement Administrative Directive, which council recently uh, reviewed. We could have ones on how we're handling insurance claims. Um, we have one on determination of yield versus stop sign control at various intersections when we need to evaluate that. And it's really about ensuring that these processes are repeated. They're important enough that they ought to be repeat the same way and consistently applied. So things like the offsite levy model uh, and bylaw update process, but they're quite administrative in, in detail um, and, and often would require a level of understanding of that industry role or job that the public would not be expected to have. So, they could contain industry specific language or uh, as I say, sort of there, there's a expectation of certain uh, levels of expertise or education in that role that may be required when you're looking at administrative directive. Code of practice, I said is kind of a sidebar uh, level and it's when um, external legislation applies an expectation that must be satisfied by the municipality. The code of practice is our documentation of how our practice satisfies that external expectation. So it could be occupational health and safety, it could be uh, certain fire uh, things. Largely in our municipality, it is about occupational health and safety where they say you must you know, perform these things um, and we say, well, here's how we work alone in a way that complies with the legislation. Eric, were you looking to jump in before I do this last one? Or no? no, I was turning my fan on before I pass out. <laughs> Is that exciting for you? <laughs> That's... No, I just warm. <laughs> uh, and then we have a uh, the lowest level, which would be like procedures, procedural 
manuals, guidelines, checklists, operating standards. It's kind of a grab bag of things. And we uh, we deliberately make the, it's a little bit more of a messy, less standardized approach because what we are trying to do uh, is encourage employees who are doing tasks to document the way they're doing those tasks at the individual level. And so if we say, oh, it has to be an official thing and it's gotta be on this template and so on and so forth, it, it just won't happen. Um, and so right now we're coming from a very small library, I would say of operating standards that's been growing over the last two, three years. Um, but these are less standardized things. And they would typically be a manager saying to their staff, here's how I want you to do that specific job. And so it could be a flow chart, it could be a checklist. Um, and here you would see a lot of abbreviations, a lot of industry jargon and expectations of a high degree of working knowledge of that topic. Accordingly, we do not publicly post these. Um, Council would have access uh, upon request, of course, uh, with that disclaimer that yeah, you may see some spelling errors and formatting things, and you know it's very workman paper, workman like papers. Um, and I, I skipped over that on the administrative directives. Those are also not publicly posted, like administrative and council policies would be publicly posted. They would be available upon request to the CAO as well. And again, that's just due to the the volume and the working nature of a lot of these administrative directives, they, are, they haven't typically been polished and sort of branded in a way that's suitable for public disbursement uh, is, is all. And to do so would be a lot of effort for very little payback. So, excuse me, CEO Gaudi. So that was with respect to the administrative policies. Those are not, not necessarily for public no, those would be for would public. Be. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And they would be publicly posted on the website. Very good. Um, and reviewable at any time. Thank you. So with Council's endorsement, potentially, of this framework, um, we would be beginning to bring Council suggested amendments to existing documents according to this chart that you see in the back uh, at future meetings. And we would initially be putting them in the consent agenda saying, uh, much like our first two batches, you will have the ability to review anything that's in there, uh, but rather than spend uh, focused council time on what really is an administrative housekeeping activity, uh, we would propose to process those through the Consent agenda, again, with the ability to pull them out, of course, as with any consent item uh, at any time. Thank you for that. Just one item for clarity there. You went through some examples and some of those policies that were clearly operational, who collects money at an event, and some things like that. Has the MGA changed that much that these would have been even considered valid? in years past or it just seems odd to me that I can't imagine where there's been that mm -hmm. substantive a change that it would have been. So um, the MGA was modernized in 2017 and that was the most recent major uh, over overhaul of the mm -hmm document prior to that it was 2006 and i have to admit i'm not particularly familiar with the pre-2006 mga i would expect though that no some of the policies contain a level of detail that ought not to have been included even at even at that time um, there's sections sometimes marked operational component of the policy which is just does not line up with the structure of government dictated by the Municipal Government Act. Um, and, and I don't think that part changed in 2006. Very good, because there was also some items in the past that we had removed that were labeled as policies that clearly were not policy, were either 
purchasing agreements or employment contracts or things like that. So it'll be uh, great to see these come together. And I, as much as this is an ongoing thing, this first go around is liable to be a multi-year task, is it not? Yes, I expect it will be a multi-year task. Um, we found that even with the first two phases is that what seems like a quick, relatively quick thing, actually it, it to do it properly does take take time. Understandable. Thank you, uh, Councilor Hoekstra. Thanks, Mayor Creasy. I would love to introduce a tiny bit of levity here. I think if we were in junior high and we were watching someone with that kind of enthusiasm for this kind of stuff, we would call you a nerd, but that's okay. <laughs> we're just going to leave it there. <laughs> we're going to benefit from this for sure. Um, your enthusiasm was intriguing, I, I have to say. But could you just, just so we are all on the same page, the the document at the very end, um, CEO Gaudi, there's a little acronyms at the top and just to make sure that we're all on the same page so it says p-o-a-d-c-o-p -O -O at the beginning do you know where i'm going with this yeah so just so p-o would be policy administrative directive code of practice and then if you come to the right of the governance document name uh, it goes council policy administrative policy administrative directive code of practice or other being that grab bag of procedures. But like. nowhere does it say bylaw. So this list does not care, have any bylaw in it, or you do not see any review needed, like you said earlier. Um, I wouldn't say I don't see any review needed of your bylaws, but I would say, or our bylaws, our bylaws, um, but I would say the focus ought to be the policies. Um, Amending bylaws is so much more difficult and onerous that it, it's not quite as fast of a thing either okay. with the three readings and sometimes uh, having advertising requirements. Uh, I think it would actually, rather than being an administrative thing that's happening in the background, it would start to eat into your capacity to deliver your strategic objectives. And I don't think that's your intent at this time. You follow up? Councillor Connick. Thank you, Mayor Christie. I just wanted to give my kudos to those who have been involved in this process to date. I'm sure it hasn't been, I wouldn't find it particularly fun. I see you find it rather fascinating, but I, <laughs> I, I, I yeah, yeah, thank you for the work to date and my future thanks for the work to come. Because again, I think it'll be particularly onerous and it'll be time consuming. And uh, for those involved, yeah, thanks for taking that on because I think. It will be. It wouldn't be something I'd want to tackle, but uh, thanks for doing that. And it's you're right. It's important. It's important work because you need to clean that up, even just for future admin, future councils, future whatever. It's but thanks for tackling that. It's like a treasure hunt that you can control. How does it get any better, right? Anyone else? I believe that is the third and final report for this evening. With respect to next meetings, uh, a couple of regular meetings, Monday, May 9th, 5.30 p.m. here in Council Chambers, and then again on May 24th, which is a Tuesday after the long weekend. Have that noted in your calendar. There's no mistakes. Tuesday, May 24th at 5.30 p.m., and then a uh council committee meeting of the whole on monday june the 6th here at 5 30. anything before we adjourn for the evening see any uh coordinator bella bono i just wanted to let council know that there was an invite sent to the lapa grand opening for this weekend um we did have our deputy mayor that was going to attend and it was obviously extended to all of council. So that was sent out to your calendars today. Thank you. Seriously, I move to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hoekstra. All, all those in favor, very good.